singt ihr eigentlich nicht mit? Hallo und guten Abend, herzlich willkommen im Schwutz zu Scaramouche. Ich bin sehr, sehr glücklich, heute den Auftakt machen zu können mit euch und ärgere mich schon jetzt über diesen albernen Hut, den ich mir selbst aufgetan habe, weil ich schon jetzt anfange zu schwitzen. Ich möchte anfangen heute Abend... Ach nee, ich sitze ja hier, auf der falschen Seite. So. Ach, jetzt. Ich möchte den Abend einleiten und möchte euch gerne ein paar Zeilen vorlesen aus einem Buch. Das Buch heißt Freddie Mercury. Ein Leben in seinen eigenen Worten. Und da heißt es, gleich sind wir soweit. Langeweile und Eintönigkeit sind die größten Krankheiten der ganzen Welt. Ein Leben mit mir ist niemals langweilig. Exzess ist Teil meiner Natur und ich brauche die Gefahr und die Spannung. Man hat mich oft davor gewarnt, in Clubs zu gehen, weil sie zu gefährlich sind. Aber ich genieße das. Ich scheue niemals das Risiko. Ich bin nicht dafür gemacht, einfach rumzusitzen und Fernsehen zu gucken. Ich umgebe mich gerne mit seltsamen und interessanten Menschen, weil ich mich durch sie lebendiger fühle. Extrem geradlinige Menschen langweilen mich zu Tode. Ich liebe ausgeflippte Menschen. Ich bin von Natur aus rastlos und angespannt. Ich mache keine halben Sachen. Ich kann ohne Probleme von einem Extrem ins andere springen. Alles dazwischen gefällt mir nicht. Grau war niemals eine meiner Lieblingsfarben. Im Grunde verändere ich mich von Tag zu Tag wie ein Chamäleon. Ich möchte mich in positiver Hinsicht verändern, mich verbessern. Jeder Tag ist anders für mich. Und ich freue mich darüber, weil ich nicht jeden Tag dieselbe Person sein möchte. Ich kann nicht den ganzen Tag im Bett rumliegen und einfach gar nichts machen. Ich lese kaum Bücher. Für mich ist es Zeitverschwendung. Ich entspanne mich auf eine Art, die die meisten Menschen nicht nachvollziehen können, indem ich einfach für 20 Minuten im Flugzeug schlafe. Das ist die ganze Entspannung, die ich brauche. Ich brauche keine Unmenge an Schlaf. Ich komme gut mit drei oder vier Stunden Schlaf die Nacht aus. Das reicht mir. In dieser kurzen Zeit lade ich meine Batterien wieder auf und dann bin ich wieder wach. Ich muss jeden Tag etwas zu tun haben. Ich will meinen Lebensunterhalt verdienen. Ich kann nicht lange ruhig sitzen bleiben. Und wenn du weißt, dass du andauernd Entertainment brauchst, dann stellst du sicher, dass du es auch bekommst. Vielleicht bin ich gierig danach, aber ich bin ein Entertainer. Das liegt mir im Blut. Ich bin ein Zirkuspferd, also gebt mir eine Bühne. Allerdings habe ich so auch irgendwie ein Monster erschaffen und mit dem muss ich nun mal leben. Wahrscheinlich drehe ich in ein paar Jahren völlig durch. Dann werde ich einer dieser wahnsinnigen Musiker sein. Meine Arbeit treibt mich an und ich werde weitermachen, solange es mein Körper mitmacht. Dinge, die den totalen Einsatz einfordern, gefallen mir am besten. Zwölf Stunden Arbeit am Tag und schlaflose Nächte. Und das geht nicht nur mir so. Phil Collins ist, glaube ich, ein Vorzeigebeispiel, weil auch er ein echter Workaholic ist. Die Leute halten mich für eine richtige... Das Wort beginnt mit F, aber das kann ich hier nicht sagen. Und es ist nicht... Flauschibärchen. Ich bin nicht leicht zu handeln und in den Augen mancher Leute bin ich eine Schlampe. Eine Schlampe zu sein gefällt mir tatsächlich. Ich umgebe mich gerne mit Schlampen. Ich suche ganz sicher nicht nach perfekten Menschen, denn das würde ich langweilig finden. Ich streife durch die Stadt wie ein tollwütiger Hund und möchte das Leben genießen. Allerdings lege ich im Moment größeren Wert darauf, den Leuten zu beweisen, dass ich ganz normal bin. Es ist beschissen, wenn die Leute denken, oh, Freddie Mercury, der spricht doch nicht mit mir. Ihr seht also, es ist ein schmaler Grad. Denn wenn die Leute glauben, dass du zwar Geld und Erfolg hast, aber trotzdem immer noch ein ganz normaler Kerl bist, dann trampeln sie auf dir rum. Dann muss man innehalten und sagen, ich bin immer noch ein gottverdammter Star, hab etwas Respekt. Wir können aber trotzdem eine Tasse Tee zusammen trinken und ein bisschen abrocken. Es ist alles eine Frage der Disziplin. Wie gesagt, das war ein kleiner Ausschnitt aus dem Buch Freddie Mercury, ein Leben in seinen eigenen Worten. Und was ich ja ganz spannend finde, schon allein aus diesem kleinen Ausschnitt kriegt man, glaube ich, ein ganz gutes Bild davon, was Freddie Mercury eigentlich so für ein Typ war. Dass der ja, viele, viele Facetten hatte, dass der wahnsinnig rastlos war und irgendwie auch immer getrieben, angetrieben von sich selbst. Und da fragen Sie sich natürlich, wie kann so ein Mensch sich hinsetzen und seine Autobiografie schreiben? Hat er natürlich niemals. Dazu hatte der überhaupt keine Zeit und überhaupt keine Lust. Und jetzt kommen zwei Gentlemen ins Spiel ähm, mit dem Namen Greg Brooks und Simon Lapton. 
Greg Brooks ist sehr, sehr viele Jahre schon der offizielle Archivar von Queen. Also der Mann, der quasi Zugang hat zu dem Allerheiligsten. Also da, wo die ganzen Tonbänder lagern, die ganzen Videoaufnahmen, die, die Zeitungsartikel, die Bilder und so weiter. Und Simon Lapton ist äh, Produzent. Der hat unter anderem für die BBC in den letzten Jahren sehr, sehr viele, auch wirklich sehr, sehr tolle Dokumentationen über Queen und über Freddy gemacht. Vielleicht habt ihr da schon mal die ein oder andere äh, von gesehen. Und die beiden, die haben sich irgendwann mal zusammengesetzt und gesagt, warum suchen wir nicht mal alles, was Freddy jemals gesagt hat, in Fernsehinterviews, in Zeitungen, Zeitungsinterviews, Radiointerviews, warum suchen wir das nicht mal zusammen, schreiben das auf und basteln daraus sowas wie eine Autobiografie. Die Autobiografie, die Freddy niemals selber geschrieben hat, aber die trotzdem aus seinen eigenen Worten bestehen. Jetzt machen wir einen kleinen Sprung ins Frühjahr 2020. Ich glaube, wir wissen alle sehr gut, wo wir da alle gewesen sind, nämlich zu Hause auf der Couch und haben Netflix kaputt geguckt. So auch ich. Und ich habe aber dann erfahren über Umwege, dass Greg gerade jemanden sucht, der dieses Buchprojekt auf Deutsch übersetzt. Und ich habe sofort gesagt, klar, <lacht> sieht glaube ich ganz gut aus, wenn man für Freddie Mercury gearbeitet hat im Lebenslauf. Und so kam es dann auch. Ich habe das natürlich nicht alleine gemacht. Ich habe das mit einem lieben Kollegen äh, aus Münster, ist er, glaube ich, der liebe Kollege Dirk Mahlzein. Herzliche Grüße. Der hat all das, was ich übersetzt habe und runtergeschrieben habe, sich noch drei, vier Mal durchgelesen, alle Fehler rot angemalt und so. Also es war quasi ein, ein, eine Teamarbeit. Und dieses Buch ist jetzt erschienen auf Deutsch. Und daraus möchte ich euch heute im Laufe des Abends äh, ja, einfach gerne ein bisschen was, was vorlesen, was Freddy so zu sagen hatte. Aber dann habe ich auch so gedacht, sich jetzt einfach hier hinzusetzen und über Freddie Mercury vorzulesen, ist ja irgendwie auch ein bisschen langweilig. Und vor allen Dingen ist es auch das, ja, dem Mann nicht wirklich würdig. Ähm, und deshalb haben wir heute Abend jemanden eingeladen. Und äh, ich freue mich wahnsinnig, dass er heute Abend hier bei uns ist, weil das ein Mensch ist, der wahrscheinlich wie kein anderer auf der Welt genau weiß, wie es ist, mit Freddie Mercury zusammenzuleben und was das für ein Mensch war. Weil er hat mit Freddie tatsächlich zusammengelebt, mehrere Jahre, eigentlich die ganzen 80er Jahre durch. Er ist mit ihm um die Welt gereist. Der war mit ihm im Aufnahmestudio, der war mit ihm feiern. Der war ja, äh, eigentlich rund um die Uhr für ihn da, auch gerade in der Zeit, wo es Freddie immer schlechter ging. Und ja, er hat ihn eigentlich gepflegt, bis äh, ganz zum Schluss. Und ja, was soll ich sagen? Ich freue mich unfassbar, dass er hier ist. Aber, und er ist hier. Und jetzt bitte ich, glaube ich, um den größten Applaus, den ihr aufbringen könnt für Peter Freestone. Peter! I said it in German, but I, but I will say it again in English. So good to have you here. So good to have you here. Thank you. You do understand a bit of German, don't you? No, not well. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yes. <laughs> but I don't speak a word. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So we, we continue in English from now on, if that's okay for you. Because I thought that's the easiest way, right? Is there anybody who doesn't speak English? Should we switch on the subtitles, the DVD subtitles? <laughs> <laughs> No, there we go. Good. That's fine. <laughs> um, Peter, first question. So all, for, for all the people who don't quite actually know who you are and what the kind of role that you play within the Queen cosmos and the Freddie Mercury universe, we've put together a couple of pictures that we are going uh -huh. to see behind us here on the big screen. And I would say just you don't know what is going to happen. I mean, you don't know what pictures we put together. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> so let's just start with the first one. And Maybe you just tell us who is this young gentleman there and whose pants is he taking care of? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I see a little. Oof. He looks a bit familiar. This was when I was very, very young, a year or two ago. Um, okay, I sort of met Freddie because I worked 
at the Royal Opera House in London for the Royal Ballet, looking after stage costumes. <clears throat> he was a special guest star at a big charity show that the Royal Ballet put on. And he actually danced, danced, he sang <laughs> as well. Um, he sang Crazy Little Thing Called Love because that was just newly the new single in 1979 and Bohemian Rhapsody, but he was being thrown around the stage by royal ballet dancers. So I went, afterwards, I went and I met him and I said, look, this was absolutely perfect, you know, your voice, Queen music and royal ballet, you know, it's just <laughs> amazing. And he was the most polite person I'd met in a long, long time which for me, I mean, this is a rock star. You know, you expect, I don't know what to expect, but I didn't expect someone being polite and being, you know, really kind and generous. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, we, we just talked a little bit and, you know, he said, no, thank you, that's, that's very kind of you. And he said, but I was at the Opera House one time and I saw you there, what, what, what work do you do? What job do you do? And so I, you know, explained to look after the costumes for the dancers, you know, put them on, take them off, get them washed, get, put them on again. And that was the end of the conversation. He went off with his friends, I went off with mine. And a week later, someone from Queen Management rang up my boss to ask if I would be available to do a six week tour with Queen looking after the stage costumes. <laughs> so, I mean, really, it was just being the right place, the right time. Um, and you said no. <laughs> well, the thing is, it, you know, most people say, oh, you must have jumped at it, you know, said yes. But it was actually a hard decision because these are, were rock stars. This was a band. Um, I didn't know how many people were in the band, what their names were or anything. And this is long before internet. So also, if you were working at the Opera House, you had a pension, you had a job for life, you, you know, you, you, you were taken care of. So I was going to give all of that up and not know what I was going to do. But, yes, I said yes, um, <laughs> in the end, because I, I, I don't want this to sound bad, but if you stayed at the Opera House, there was very little chance of promotion, because everybody stayed. You had to wait for someone to die before <laughs> there was a place to move up to. And I just wasn't prepared for that. <laughs> um, and so, um, that's what I started. So, that's, that was taken at the Royal Opera House? No, I think. no, no, no. Oh, no. that was while you were no, working for Queen this already? Was with Queen already, yeah. And whose pens are these? Those are know? Freddy's, red What's ones. Freddy? The red ones, but they're inside out. Ah. Because you couldn't put an iron on the vinyl on the other side, because it would just melt. <laughs> so, this was on the inside. But ironing, of course, wasn't the only thing that you had to do behind the stage. We found some other pictures from that era. So, but ah, yeah. Um, so this is you and Roger Taylor, right? Yes. Um, this is, I don't know if it was going on stage or off stage. No, going on stage, because he's not sweating. <laughs> um, but, we, yeah, because it's all dark, you have to get band members onto stage. So you're there with a torch. And it was the same at the end of the show. They would come off and you were at the top of the stairs waiting for them oh. with a dressing gown to put around them and take them off to the dressing room. Mm -hmm. um, it was, it was a, uh, I don't know, it was a lot of different things, the job. You just were there when somebody asked for something. You were there, you did it. It was good. <laughs> it was good. Well, look, there's another one from backstage. That is, yes, that is a backstage. And what I found pretty interesting, I mean, this was probably taken in 81 or 82, I would think. 
Yeah, when did and John wear blue? 82? <laughs> Ask Wolf. Wolf sits there and he's nodding. When did John wear blue? Uh, 81 already. <laughs> okay. 81, so okay, it's early right. 80s. But so this is around the time when Queen was already like one of the biggest bands on the planet. Oh, yeah. But yeah. as you see, this, this back, backstage doesn't look glamorous at all. So it's very... They, very, they didn't. No they white words In those days, it was just because if it's in an arena or whatever, you're just in one of the dressing rooms mm. for the football team or the ice hockey team or whoever plays there normally. It was just one of the dressing mm. rooms. In the days when I worked all those years ago <laughs> um the whole band was in one dressing room mm. they were all in just used one dressing room as we see here all yeah. of them are in the pictures um freddie's now on john's shoulder you can yeah. see him peeking, peeking behind the shoulder and the one in black is brian's bodyguard ah. um and but now everybody has their own dressing room their own person looking after costumes, their own everything. White carpets. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and everything's sort of covered. You, you wouldn't see tiles. They would be covered now in sort of white curtains and, mm. you know. Why? You're in there <laughs> to get changed. So that was the time when you were literally taking care of all the four yes. members of Queen, Yeah, right? I started off for the first year um, looking after the costumes for the whole band on tour. At the end of 1980, um, Freddie came to me and said, look, I will be doing two years away from Britain. Would you be interested in taking care of me? And I said, well, yeah. Forget it. <laughs> well, no, I, 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 said, yes, I, I said, yeah, but why two years away? And he said he was fed up giving 80% of his money to the tax man. Because in those days, that's what happened. And he wanted to put money in his pocket instead of the tax man. And to do that, he had to be out of the country. It wasn't so hard because they always recorded outside of Britain. They were touring around the world a lot of the time. And to have a year out, you could have two weeks at the end of the year in Britain. And they could always do English, you know, British dates in those two weeks. So it wasn't that hard. It just meant that he was going to be elsewhere in the world and he wanted someone with him to, you know, to take care of him, to do everything that he couldn't do. As we see here. <laughs> yeah. Ah, this is the cropped I love this photograph. picture. I love this picture. This is the cropped photograph. Is it? Yeah. So what are the details that we don't see here? What are the... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, um, this actually, I mean, you can tell it's a hotel suite in New York. This was in 1981. Freddie was living in New York, we have to tell you. Freddie yeah. was living in New York for a short period of time, right? In the early 80s. And, and he actually, we were living in the penthouse suite of the Berkshire Place Hotel at this point, while Freddie was in the process of buying an apartment. Um, we'd got in, we had arrived, and obviously he always called friends ahead saying, I'm going to be there this time, come. So there were already three or four friends of his there. And one of them just turned around and said, look, We've, we've, n we've never seen any photographs of you and Freddie together. Why, why, you know, let's have one. And I said, well, you know, normally, of course, I'm not there because I'm the one taking the photographs, normally. <laughs> and so they said, OK, look, we just take one of you two together. And at that point was actually kneeling on the floor for some reason. And Freddie just literally grabbed me. And that's what you see. Um, <laughs> Now, the bit that's missing, oh. um, you can tell it's a hotel room because of the room service yes. table. Yes. You, know, the, you could see the tablecloth table cloth and yeah. everything. The first thing I ever had to do as soon as we arrived in the door was order hot Earl Grey tea with milk. 
to be delivered by room service. And I thought originally that it was on this table, um, but on the extended table, there's also the other drink I had to order, which was, of course, vodka and tonic. <laughs> so it's hot tea and milk, and three bottles of vodka and a lot of tonic, please. <laughs> um, so, so yeah. that was mainly your tasks, ordering vodka just, and stuff. So, so what does it mean just, working for Freddie Mercury, uh, Freddie's personal assistant? What would well, I, uh, Basically, I lived his normal everyday life that all of us live. Hmm. You know, um, I paid the bills, hmm. I went shopping, I did the cooking, I did everything. Um, I did, what, as I say, what we all do in normal life that Freddie couldn't do uh, and to give him the chance to create the music, hmm. which was what, you know, we were saying earlier, Freddie, as far as Freddie is concerned, what, I'm sorry if I actually speak about him in the present tense every now and then, but that's He's just fine. here. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, Freddie said at one point that every person on this earth is put here for a reason. Some people are here to drive. Some people are here to cook. I am here to create music. Because he couldn't drive, he couldn't cook. <laughs> so there were people to do that in his mind and that's that's the way he thought because that, that was what he was he was all about music Freddie was all about music so that means you were basically with him like 24 7 right yeah for the first from 1980 to 1985 mm -hmm. basically everywhere Freddie went I was there I have a pretty interesting photograph the next one this is one that probably not many people have seen. Uh -huh. you, he recognizes it. This one was actually taken by Wolf, who sits right down there, who's like the biggest queen maniac you can imagine. And he had the guts to travel to Munich back in 1982, I believe this was taken, yeah. right? Wait outside, and waiting outside the, 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 the recording music, studio, the, music, music band band. studios, yeah. and waiting for the band. And he took some snapshots, and this is one of them. And yeah, this that is was basically us. what you had to do, like grocery Go. shopping. Yeah. Well, yeah. Freddie could. He always had. You, you'll see in almost uh, most pictures you see of him outside. He's got this shoulder bag, mm -hmm. so that's enough for him to carry. He can't carry anything else. Um, <laughs> but in that bag, it was it was incredibly interesting because it was always the same things. It always had. <laughs> Architectural Digest, a packet of cigarettes, a lighter, strepsils, and his birthday book. His birthday book? Ah. He had, he had this small, sort of like a little address book, but it had padded covers. Mm -hmm. And inside he had the birthdays of all of his friends. Mm. So he always, because he had it, he always made sure the friends of his had a birthday card, at least, if he wasn't in the country, from him for their birthdays. He was, he was amazing like that. He was the, one of the most thoughtful person, people you could ever wish to meet. He would do anything for his friends. Um, that was just... He, he knew the value of real friendship, of real friends. He knew, of course, that there were a lot of people who wanted to meet him because of who he was. You know, whenever he was being introduced to someone, he had to think immediately, are they going to talk to the star or are they going to talk to me? And most of the time, I think 95% of the time, he always got it right. Hmm. He knew exactly what the people were there for. Hmm. Um, I remember there was a few, one time, I think it was later in the 80s, that um, there were three or four of us. We just saw this person and we knew exactly why, he, why they were there. Mm. You know, they were just trying to get whatever they could out of him. But Freddie was letting it happen. And so I went to him and I said, look, 
I know you, you like this person, but you know why they're around. He says, yes, I do. I'm not was stupid. It, was it press people? Or? No, no, it was just someone who wanted to be his friend. Ah, I see. And he said, yes, I do know why they're around. But it's up to me to say when they go. Hmm. So he was a very, very good judge of character. Scott, I'm a fool, Scott, I'm a fool.